Welcome to the Orange Couch Talks, a deeper dive from our leaders into our recent teachings. Hey, welcome to the Orange Couch Talks. I'm here with Pastor TC and Pastor Andrew. I'm Pastor Jackie. And uh, this past weekend, we talked about Solomon, wrapped up our Song of Songs series, which was all about romance and love. And then we kind of said the rest of the story was Solomon didn't end particularly well. It's kind of unique because I'm sitting here next to two really young guys. Like, what are you, 25, 30. 6, 7, 30? You're about to be 30, I know, yeah. with this conversation. So you guys are just starting out in life. And uh, Solomon, we kind of looked at from not his young days, which is when he wrote mm-hmm. the Song of Songs, but we looked to kind of at his, the entirety of his life. And into his old age, which even included writing Ecclesiastes and all of the pessimism that that surrounded his life at that point. And we kind of talked about ending not so well. Yep. And uh, I've lived long enough and been ministry long enough that I've known uh, several guys that have kind of flamed out in ministry and not ended well. Um, and you guys, although you're young, you probably know guys too that mm-hmm. have not mm-hmm. ended well. I had a great guy in my life that I won't name his name, but he served on my staff and then he went from my staff. I recommended him to a, a, a really good church uh, and he went there and pastored. And um, man, he just messed up. He had an affair. I found him in a hotel room. Uh, hiding from the world. His hands were bloodied and bruised because he had been beating uh, his fist against the wall because, mm. I mean, near the point of taking his life. And and this guy, I'm telling you, he was A+. plus. He was one of the best communicators, one of the best thinkers, one of the best leaders. I mean, it's mm. rare to have a guy that thinks well, speaks well, leads well. He was the total package. And he was also a incredibly handsome, good-looking dude, uh, all of that stuff. He had, he had all of it. And then in one season of his life, he kind of lost it all. Fortunately, his story was he repented and he kept his family together, but he lost his ministry. Um, so today we want to sit around and talk with an old guy and some young guys. How do we end well? What did you think? You preached on this passage, or yeah. kind of really more than a passage, just sort of biography of Solomon. What did what were some of your takeaways about uh, Solomon and the pitfalls? Well, I think one thing we talked about is that it, even though you get to like First Kings eleven, and then it kind of shows you where the deteriorating, like everything falls apart, that all that had been bubbling under the surface for a long time. And we think of guys like our culture, you get the gotcha moment and then someone's canceled or someone falls off their pedestal. And it's like, we think it all happened at that one point. And it's always a gradual, slow drift. Mm -hmm. And we called it a life drift. And I think we saw that in Solomon, that it started with the small compromises he made. Marrying the Pharaoh's daughter, which I think is a second marriage because I think Song of Mm -hmm. Solomon is his first marriage. That was a second marriage. That was a compromise. And it was, and God even blessed him after that. So he had former sin in his life that he never really dealt with yeah. I and think exposed. Even, even it says, like, and I think in 1 Kings 11, that he married Pharaoh's daughters and other yeah. <laughs> Sidonites, you know, Ammonites. And he mm-hmm. liked all the women. Uh, he was he was very uh, non-discretionary, non, uh, what should I say? He, he didn't discriminate <laughs> against any he women. He liked all women. Yeah. yeah. But it was, I mean, I, I think some of that, there was sin in his life. And then he kept on going in his career path as a king and even in his spiritual life hit some highs after that point, Mm -hmm. but never dealt with that sin. And I think it kind of haunted him later on because he never ripped the root out, I feel like, and it was always in his heart. And then later on, it just fed more on him and then everything came crumbling down. Well, it was interesting too, because in, in his sin by marrying Pharaoh's daughter, he still had ways that he was trying to justify that you can read the text. Mm-hmm. He was like, well, she can't live 
in the palace because she's not of God's people. So I'll build her her own palace, and and she can't be around the temple because she's not of God's people. But so so she might have been happy by that. Like I get my own house. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But I, I think I think he tried to compartmentalize this. Yeah, okay, right. so this sin is over here, but it, I can justify it because it it helps keep God's people safe. And it's really easy for us to do. Okay, well, you know, well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to push this off to the side because I'm doing, I'm going to church. This is all right. Or, you know, I, I'm not a bad person and we feel like we can split it up, but sin, sin doesn't stay compartmentalized. Yeah. We start disobeying God and the, the damage from that overflows. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, possible for us to throw a lot of shade on Solomon but the lesson we should learn is that we're all susceptible to Absolutely. to drifting. We're all susceptible to sin and compromise in our lives. Um, Solomon um, had a better start than I did. Probably you, either of you did. I mean, God asked, you know, you can have anything in the world you want. And he didn't say at that time, he said, well, I want the hottest wife. Or he didn't say, I want the most money or I want, mm-hmm. I want the most fame. He said, I want wisdom. And... God gave him wisdom, so much wisdom, they wrote the book of Proverbs, which is the book of wisdom in the Old Testament. Uh, so he had a great start, early career, everything up and to the right, right? And uh, yet he failed, and he had the lineage of David. I mean, he had all of this great stuff in his life, and yet he failed. And I would say to us that that's a cautionary tale that all of us need to realize that we're susceptible to drifting. Um, I, I had a friend text me uh, the other day, just yesterday actually, uh, and he said, uh, he quoted a little statement I used to say a lot uh, when, when we were living near each other. He said, yep, life is a meat grinder. And I used to say it all the time, life mm-hmm. is a meat grinder. If you're not careful, it can chew you up, spit you out. Yeah. And I think you see a little bit of that in Solomon's life. Man, the life was a meat grinder. And yeah, he was successful, everything outwardly. I think there's some inward demons. I mean, you read Ecclesiastes. Yeah. There were some inward demons. Life is meaningless. You know, that's not something, you know, that's not the series you want to preach next <laughs> next Sunday. Here, Easter's coming. Life is meaningless. <laughs> uh, and yet, at, at the end of his days, that's what he talked yeah. about primarily. So how do we... We talked about some ways that we kind of maybe guard against that. What are some ways that we guard against this drifting, being chewed up and spit out by the meat grinder of life? You know, before we get into that, I do want to say... No, that's what I I wanted to talk about. But just to piggyback on, we're all susceptible to this. I think our world doesn't like to talk about how ugly our sin is. A great example right now is Ravi Zacharias and like yeah. there's and that's a horrible story and it's terrible and and people and pastors have come out as like you know we also need to be careful in this moment not to just throw condemnation because yeah. we all can fall into that but we see guys like Ravi or Solomon and it's so easy to say well I would never be that bad I would never be that sinful and it's like I think we're lying to ourselves that our sin is actually that clean and it's like you know everyone's poop stinks right it's all that same and it's like we all have that terrible sin nature in us if we leave unchecked can go in a bad place and i think it's almost like in the twitter verse and social media it's really easy to sit on a high chair and judge other people when it's like we can all fall really yeah. far so before we go to my question let me ask another question that kind of piggybacks on that it's a question i was asked after one of the services uh, in surprise this past weekend so did solomon go to hell was solomon saved and then you also have that whole movement today. And for those that don't know the Ravi Zacharias story, um, a brainiac of an apologetic Mm -hmm. uh, leader in Christian movement, after his death, accused of some things and then investigated and feel like even the committee that investigated him from his own organization said, yeah, it looks like he had some moral Mm -hmm. failures related to sexuality. And so what you see in the Christian movement is people like Backbelly. Well, I used to quote him all the time, but now I don't even believe he's a Christian. Yeah, we're going to burn his books. And, and, uh, yeah. So let's ask this question. Solomon ends, after marrying 700 women, 300 concubines, wondering if life isn't but meaningless. Was he saved? It's a hard question because it's an old, in an Old Testament context before 
you know, what we see in Christ and the crucifixion and resurrection. Um, uh, so I'm just going to let you guys answer that question. I didn't have an answer for the guy Sunday. I said, watch the Orange Couch Talks. TC and Andrew will tell you. Well, he came to me and asked me that on Sunday. Oh, said, Pastor Jackie would love to answer it for you. <laughs> just keep on pushing. Okay. Um, I'm, my answer so now it's be, Andrew. Uh, yeah, we're both. <laughs> Please, teach us. Um, I'm going to have a cop out and say I don't know, but what I'll point to is I, I think there was definitely a chance for redemption. And Ecclesiastes, I think, is an indictment on his own life that he missed the mm. mark. But literally my favorite verse is Ecclesiastes 3.11. It says he has made everything beautiful in, in its time, yet men cannot fathom what he has done. Or he has said, turning in the hearts of men, yet men cannot fathom yeah. what he's done from beginning to end. And what Solomon recognized is he filled his heart with women, with money, with power, with all these things. But there is an eternal void in his life that only could be filled by an eternal loving God. And I think whether Solomon did fill his heart with that at the end of his life, I don't know, but he did recognize that was the problem. Yeah. And I think Ecclesiastes is a beautiful, almost like, I, I like to read it as like a repentance of his life. Where did he go from there? I don't know, mm-hmm. but I, I think well, I think behind that question uh, is somewhat of a mixed understanding of grace and salvation itself. Mm-hmm. In that we think salvation is based upon us and our ability to do good and our ability mm-hmm. to earn the approval of God uh, when we really believe the New Testament teaches that it is by grace that we are saved. That's, right. That's God's riches at Christ's expense. Um, that it's not of ourselves, lest any man should boast, Paul says. Now, that's not a license to sin, all right? We're not saying sure. it's a license to sin, but it's like the age-old question, like, does a guy commit suicide go to heaven? Well, you're assuming that suicide is the last act of sinful rebellion mm-hmm. in his life, and then therefore he had no opportunity to repent of it. That means he probably went to heaven. I don't see salvation predicated upon my goodness, and mm-hmm. I'm really thankful for that. Mm-hmm. Or being the last time I get to repent of a sin. Yeah. Like, oh, I, ah, I missed I it right before I cut that died. person off and on the I freeway, yeah. and then I got in a wreck, and I didn't get a chance to say I'm sorry. You drive careful. <laughs> yeah, and so I think underneath, yeah. layered underneath that question is really a question of what do we believe about the grace of God. And then I for think sure. for you, in the answer that you gave, I agree, is that we, that's in the mysteries of God. Mm-hmm. That's not something for me to say yes or no to. Um, well, and if somebody wrote a book on all the actions in our, I don't think anybody would have. Oh, that person's definitely in heaven. Yeah. They're perfect. Because I mean, we we got there is a person Jesus. writing a book about that. <laughs> it's in heaven, and yet mm-hmm. there's the Lamb's Book of Life, mm-hmm. which has our name in it. And so, yeah, I think underneath that but again that doesn't give us a license to sin it doesn't give it because it destroyed other lives i mean there's negative yep. impacts on it so let's go back to the question that you originally dodged uh how can we avoid this drifting what are some things that we can put in place in our lives just very practically for our audience what are some ways that you things that you practically put in place to help avoid this dangerous drift mm. I would say, I mean, you you covered this on Sunday, um, but find people that can speak into your life truth. And and I would recommend it be people who are living the life that you want to live. Like, you know, find godly people who have not drifted far away from God and and let them speak into your life. And so whenever you have questions, whenever you're frustrated, being able to, to have a sounding board that'll say, you know what, you're being selfish or you're stupid or hey, you know, these are good questions to ask yourself. And here's what, when I ask, when I ask myself those things, here's what God taught me. So that way you have somebody that can steer you back. Cause we, like you said, we all will drift. So how do we, how do we prevent that? And one of it's having people that can say, Hey, you're drifting here. Mm-hmm. Cut it out. Um, I mean, we, we dove into it a lot on Sunday as I, I just, I love the perfect contrast we get between Solomon's life and how he caved to his temptations and Jesus in the desert and how he kind of got over those temptations because Jesus was tempted with all the same things. And I think it's, you know, it's talking about like, for example, Solomon tried to fill that void in his life with 
endless women, money, and power. Jesus didn't have, I don't he didn't have a created void in his life, but he looked to God for his fulfillment and his sustenance. And I think for us, it's always the church answer, but it is the answer is like, are we finding our satisfaction in God or are we finding our satisfaction in other mortal things? Because that's like a big distinction because even when you talk about sex, for example, there's this idea, and I remember growing up in church, it's like, as soon as you get married, you'll never have any problems with sex ever again. And it's like, how many married men have problems with pornography? It's like, if you don't deal with it and find the fulfillment in God, it's not going to magically go away with things yeah. in our world. And it's like, what? Wh- how are we trying to fill that void, um, that just that emptiness in our lives? Yeah. We talked about some of that uh, surprise as well as as well as what you talked about is accountability, um, and and I know every time you go to a men's conference or something, it's like be accountable, and everybody <laughs> gets all excited about accountability, and we'll sit around fireplaces and fire pits, and we'll 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 you know cut our fingers and make a bond together that we're going to be blood brothers and we're going to be accountable to each other. Uh, really um, intense moment. You guys have yeah. not been to the same men's retreat. Oh, <laughs> but uh, I often like say to these guys, it's like, it's so easy to lie to other guys that you don't live with, that you don't, don't know mm-hmm. you on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Like, I think if you're married, your number one accountability partner ought to be your spouse. And to be able to, you know, to be to have your calendar, your technology, uh, your time, uh, all be subject to the eyes of your spouse, I think is huge. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. so. My stomach's. I can hear it. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Uh, It's time for lunch. Let's wrap (laughs) this up. Uh, But I've jokingly, but kind of seriously, said that for for me to have an affair, I'm like I live eight. I live like eight miles from the church. It takes me like twelve, thirteen minutes, depending on school zones and what is happening to get home. I'd have to like have an affair between the time I leave the office and the time I get to the house because if I'm not where I'm supposed to be, she's on me. You know, where are you? What's going on? And I'm like, but I need that in my life. Mm-hmm. And to try to avoid that and try to live like as if we don't need accountability is is just bizarre. We yeah. all need it. I'm <clears throat> telling you, I need accountability. For sure. And I'm happy that uh, in, in my case, Tanya provides that. So, I, I, and on, I, I mean, I've had people before ask me, like, hey, Pastor, can you be my accountability partner? I'm like, you know, that that's not going to be helpful to you. If you're looking for somebody outside of your life to help you keep your life together, it's not going to work. Like, yeah. you need to find people that are, a, that see you, in know your circle. you. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you got to be, able to be transparent whenever you're called on it but that. yeah and I think to that point people inside your circle I think you have this le- different levels and layers of accountability mm-hmm. I think you have your spouse if you're married uh, good friends if you're single um, but also I think all of us that are married have people at our work I mean you guys hold me accountable I hold you accountable it's like why are you late again TC what was going on uh, what why I think in, in our circle of environment, and you ha- and it doesn't have to be a, a, a Christian work environment. You could find uh, Christian believers at your job place. Mm-hmm. Hey, listen, man, here's what I'm working on. And they're going to see you every day. And they're going to know what you're doing every day and how you're treating people every day. I think, and it's not just sexual sins. Like, it's like you were a douchebag to that guy at work. Why are you treating, why are you talking to that person that way, right? Yeah. Uh, can I say that? I guess I you can. did. I did. It's out there. Well, holding me accountable. Um, but, uh, uh, well, I'm probably the wrong person to hold you accountable for that. <laughs> okay, uh, I repent. Uh, but you were a really bad. That's how it happens, you, right there, guys. You were a really <laughs> bad person in your demeanor to that person. You can't do that. Yeah, that's accountability. And so, listen, there is the danger of the drift. We're all going to deal with it. I've talked about how there's this undercurrent of the world that always wants to pull our boat out to sea and into danger. That's the world. 
and there's there was something I don't remember if you said it on stage this weekend or if it was in conversations this week when we were talking about it. But and I don't even remember exactly how you phrased it, so please correct it. But you said basically that what we do in our lives is exaggerated by our children. Oh yeah, um, what we do in them minimum our children do the maximum our children do the there maximum. we go and that man that has been on my mind since you've said it and for me that's such additional accountability like i'm thinking through like what what am i what mm. am i teaching my kid about when i get up in the morning how am i active how am i praying with her how am i treating her mother how am i treating other people? like i want to make sure that if she's going to maximize that how am i setting her up and and that's i mean that that's really sat with yeah, me like good. shoot like I need to fix my posture. I need to, <laughs> all this stuff. I got to yes. set her up for success. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in so many levels. And then another thing that we said Sunday at Cross Church in Surprise, I kind of want to end in with is small compromises have big consequences. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what you see in Solomon's life early on, just small compromises. Mm-hmm ended up having big consequences. And so how important it is to guard our hearts, guard our lives. Um, my goodness, my stomach is growling again. Uh, small com- compromises. and Because this stuff doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. I don't wake up and have 700 wives. <laughs> There's some stuff that happens before that that leads to that. And so we're just encouraging you. All of us struggle, all right? Mm-hmm. All of us have uh, this undercurrent of the world that pulls us and we need each other i think that's why we need the church i think that's why we need community i think that's why as we kind of get close to post-covid we're saying come back to church get back in a bible group have those kind of accountability uh guardrails around your life because we need each other to live this faith because the world you know life can be a meat grinder and we need the encouragement of god's people God's Word, and God's presence in our life on a daily basis. Hey, we love you. Hope you have a great day. And we start a new series this coming weekend at both of our campuses called Searching. And this weekend we're talking about searching for significance. And man, is the world uh, searching for significance today. And we're going to end this series on Easter Sunday, Searching for Hope. And we're starting a brand new campaign leading up to Easter called hope for the city and we hope that you'll start inviting your friends and family check out our social media pages as we crank out some great content in the days to come and be sure and share that with your Mm -hmm. friends and invite them to easter at cross church phoenix cross church surprise and we look forward to seeing you at both places thanks for tuning in make sure to rate review and subscribe and don't forget to go out and make jesus known